celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. I know there's some soybean fields out there that probably won't put a pot on them because of dicamba. And then there's some that just kind of have some puckering in the leaves that you may or may not see a yield loss because of. Today on Farm Week, complaints continue about damage from suspected herbicide drift out in the field. Over in the kitchen, learn how to make zoodle noodles from Natasha. And in the garden, Gary profiles the classic tree that can make quite a statement around any home. Plus, you'll meet a master gardener who has taught and inspired countless green thumbs. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Amy Myers. Thanks for tuning in to Farm Week. And it is certainly hard to believe we are already starting the month of August. Oh, I know, and school is starting in many areas, so everyone needs to keep an eye out for school buses and kids. That's right, and many farmers have been keeping an eye out for, for something else of this growing season, pesticide drift. At times this summer, it seems, the Mid-South is ground zero for drift complaints involving the herbicide dicamba. A Monsanto company survey of state ag departments finds over 600 suspected cases in Arkansas, 130 in Missouri, 76 in Tennessee, and 60 in Mississippi. In case after case, farmers are reporting suspected crop damage they associate with a neighboring farmer's use of dicamba. For example, dicamba can cause some puckering in the leaves, as you see in this example. Or even worse, when it touches soybean plants that are not the new dicamba tolerant Extend variety. An Extension Service crop specialist says the full extent of the damage may not be known for a while. You all know what 2,4-D will do to cotton, that's about how sensitive soybeans are to dicamba. I know there's some soybean fields out there that probably won't put a pot on them because of dicamba. And there's some that just kind of have some puckering in the leaves that you may or may not see a yield loss because of. We have issues here. Are they as widespread in those other states? In my opinion, I would say not as widespread. We got them. There's no, there's no denying that we have them. Is some of that a learning curve? I don't know. Is some of that things that we could avoid? Probably so, honestly. But there's some things that I, don't, that I think we probably can't avoid. If MSU Extension or a consultant or another agronomist identifies a plant situation as a suspected drift problem, the grower is told to contact the Bureau of Plant Industry, which has responsibility for regulatory issues in Mississippi. Monsanto says it spent years developing the Extendamax technology to minimize the potential for off-site movement. The company calls dicamba products valuable tools to manage problematic weeds. And Monsanto says it remains committed to helping farmers use the Roundup Ready Extend crop system successfully and wants to do what it can to help. What if you could make the pasta dishes you and your family love in a healthier way and even sneak them past picky eaters? In this week's The Food Factor segment, MSU Extension's Natasha Haynes tells us about a fresh, healthy alternative to pasta, zoodles. Looking for a creative way to add more vegetables to your diet? How about when you can slip by the pickiest of eaters? It's zoodle time! Pasta made out of zucchini doesn't necessarily sound like it would work, but zoodle noodles are all the rage right now. Here is a very simple introduction to making them. Start by cutting zucchini into thin, noodle-like strips using a vegetable spiralizer or a potato peeler. Place strips in a colander and toss with two teaspoons of salt. After draining for 30 minutes, add zucchini to a boiling pot of water and cook for one minute. Drain immediately following cooking and rinse with cold water. Next, in a separate skillet, heat a drizzle of extra virgin olive oil over medium heat and add the zucchini strips along with chopped mushrooms, garlic, and tomatoes. Stir for approximately five minutes 
and dust lightly with Parmesan cheese to finish the recipe. This is one of many, many Zoodle recipes, so try it out. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. For even more Zoodle recipes, visit the Food Factors Pinterest page. What tree would you say is the symbol of Mississippi? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman tells us about the Southern Magnolia. Mississippi is known as the Magnolia State, and what better tree to represent the state? The Southern Magnolia. Southern Gardening has highlighted the early spring deciduous magnolias, displaying beautiful pink flowers before the leaves emerge. These are absolutely gorgeous, but for many gardeners, when they hear the word magnolia, it's synonymous with our native evergreen, the Southern Magnolia. This is the classic magnolia with its large, thick and glossy leaves. The individual oblong leaves are five to eight inches long and feel leathery. The bottoms of the leaves are covered with a rusty brown fuzz that is variable between plants. And true to its botanical name, Magnolia grandiflora, the flowers certainly are grand. In late spring through summer, the creamy white flowers are displayed, and you certainly can't miss the up to eight inch diameter cup-shaped bloom. The petals are thick and feel waxy and have a lemony fragrance. A great way to display indoors is floating a naked flower in a bowl of water. The flowers are replaced with cone-like seed pods. When the pods ripen, the large red seeds are pushed out and add to the beauty of this tree. And I don't think I have to remind anyone that Southern Magnolia are big trees, growing as wide as 40 feet, taking up a lot of landscape and making quite the statement. Southern Magnolia is the iconic symbol of the landscape in Mississippi and across the Southeast. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Garden. They say this is the information age, where people can instantly find any answers they're looking for. Yet, so many of us still can't figure out how to feel better. Well, here's a suggestion, eat better. And what better place than a Mississippi farmer's market to help you do just that? Locally grown fruits and vegetables are healthy, picked at the peak of quality and freshness to help you feel better. And Gary says the Southern Magnolia can add both historical and attractive charm to your home. And folks may recall Mississippi car tags had that magnolia in the center back about 1998 to 2007, something like that. Yes, that's true. Well, what's going on in the markets today? Well, in the broader picture, Amy, corn harvest began this week in the South. We'll have some analysis coming up. Also ahead, cheese gets the blame for sideways trade in milk prices. Farm-raised catfish sales are rising, and China agrees to buy U.S. rice. Chicken farmers are saying they need more export business, and apparently Washington is listening. A bipartisan group of 37 U.S. Senators, led by Mississippi's Thad Cochran and Virginia's Mark Warner, went to bat for poultry last week. The Senators called on Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue to press for the swift reopening of the Chinese market to U.S. exports. Well, although it's summer, demand is said to remain good for milk these days, so what's keeping farm gate prices from going higher? At least one analyst is putting the blame on the cheese market. We were up at the 17 levels and then cheddar cheese prices fell. And so it always comes back to pretty much the cheese market for, for milk prices right now. It's never been a supply problem. Um, it's just thankfully our demand overall is good. I don't see milk falling substantially lower. Okay. Demand is really good, but at the same time, we don't have a reason to get really above 17 either. Gotcha. So looking for a big sideways trading rate. During the just concluded month of July, hog producers enjoyed record prices for pork bellies. And when I say record, I mean like 51% higher than only one year ago. Now on the other side of the fence, consumers are being given a warning about what this means at the grocery store for them. Bacon prices are likely to top $5.50 per pound or higher by the end of August. That's a 16% jump 
from the July prices. Well, at the Pond Bank, catfish processing in the U.S., it's running about 8% above one year ago. But the latest processing report shows a little slip in fish prices. U.S. producers received a Pond Bank price of $1.14 per pound in June. That's the latest month available. That's a drop of $0.07 cents per pound from a year ago for premium size live fish. Farm sales totaled just under 30 million pounds round weight. That's an increase of 9% from June 2016. Processor sales were up 3% from a year ago at 13.5 million pounds. Well, this leads us right into our trivia quiz today. It's about fish farming in Mississippi. How many water surface acres are used for catfish production in the state in this year, 2017? Your choices are over 22,000 acres, over 24,300, 26,500, or 34,700 water acres. We'll have that answer coming up. We're going to pause now for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, crop reports and weather reports rattle the corn and soybean markets. Brian Williams is here with the background. And in today's feature, meet the master, master gardener that is. We'll introduce you to a woman who's been using her gifts as a gardener to teach and inspire others for years. Find out how she got started and why she credits Extension with providing much of her knowledge of gardening. Stay with us. Why farmers markets? Why come here? Well, there's no doubt it tastes better and heck, it's better for you too. Hooray, cantaloupe! Everywhere you look is great food. Healthy food. It's just a healthier choice and we like that it supports our community. The reason I come is because you just can't find this quality anywhere else. Hooray, farmers markets! Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. A seminar on a beloved cut flower in Mississippi is scheduled on the coast on Tuesday, August 15th. You'll spend a morning learning how to grow sunflowers along with tips on selecting the best types for your garden. There will also be instruction on using sunflowers in floral arrangements. One of the state's premier growers of sunflowers will be on hand for the seminar as well as extension horticulture specialists. And coming up a little later in August is a field day for professional turf and landscape managers. The Turf Grass Field Day takes place on Tuesday, August 22nd at the RR Foil Plant Science Research Facility on North Farm at Mississippi State. Hours are 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Sessions include topics such as turf grass breeding and selection. Mississippi rice farmers can look forward to new export business in the future. Late last month, the U.S. and China signed an agreement opening the door to U.S. milled rice being allowed into China. USA Rice President Betsy Ward says it's been a decade-long process up to this point. A few technical hurdles remain before shipments begin, including Chinese inspections of U.S. rice mills. However, Ward says the first sale may happen before January. Well, the recent meeting of the Boll Weevil Management Corporation brought continued good news to cotton producers. For the ninth year in a row, Mississippi is weevil-free. A lot of work goes into keeping that perfect record, though. We are continuing to monitor the situation by running traps uh, in, a, uh, in a surveillance manner, but we, we put a trap out within a mile of each cotton field and uh, run those traps throughout the growing season just to, in the event that any weevils were brought in by any means or happened to fly in by any means. As we mentioned a bit earlier, corn harvest is underway. Extension agent Lamar Adams reports growers began cutting grain in Pike County near Macomb Wednesday and Thursday of last week. Harvest time, along with Big July reports, are turning the corn and soybean markets a bit volatile. Ag economist Brian Williams comments. What is it about the supply and demand numbers that turned up the volatility for corn? Well, the big thing on that was a, a big increase in the ending stocks numbers. Uh, the new ending stocks were increased by about 215 uh, million bushels. The old crop was increased by 75 million bushels. Um, so, and, and the new crop, a lot of that was on larger production. So that's really the, the big driver right now. 
and these larger supplies of corn were really unexpected by the market? Well, it wasn't all that unexpected. Um, a lot of it comes back to a uh, 900,000 acre increase in planted acres that came from the June 30th report, um, and that resulted in a 1.1 million in acre increase in the, the harvested acres. Um, the yield was the same, so that really, it's the change in the acreage that bumped those numbers up so much. And I know feed use was mentioned as well. It was lower than expected. The uh, old crop feed use was lower than expected. A lot of that was from actual numbers that they saw coming in. Um, in the, the grain stocks report, uh, new crop was increased, uh, new crop feed use was increased by 50 million bushels. Um, that was just because of the ex expectation of a larger crop, larger production in combination with lower prices. Now turning to soybeans, commentaries generally are saying right now it's in full weather market mode. Explain that. Definitely. Um, it, it's, you know, we're, we're looking at a uh, uh, fairly severe drought across the northern plains. There's some prediction to some continued hot dry weather across the, the corn belt, which is where a lot of soybeans are also grown. Mm -hmm. And so with that in mind, the, the markets are responding accordingly with, with us being in kind of a key, key time in terms of determining those yields. And the latest report increased U.S. soybean acreage as well, right? Um, the harvested acres was increased, planted acres was, was the same, um, but harvested acres was increased by about 100,000 100, acres, which gives us uh, roughly a five, mo four, 5 million more bushels of production. And finally, here in Mississippi, would you say the, the bean crop is above average at this point in the summer? Well, we're, we're progressing ahead of average right now. Um, as far as the numbers, we're about 63% of our crop is, is setting pods. That's compared to a, a five-year average of about 40, 45%. So we're, we're well ahead of, of where we are usually. Back to the trivia quiz now to wrap things up in the markets. Our topic, the number of water acres used for catfish and the answer is D, close to 35,000 water acres in fish production in Mississippi this year. Like they do every year, lots of homeowners enjoy working in the yard and planting a garden. For over a quarter century now, the Master Gardener Organization has been on the front line helping extension offices answer the flood of questions that pour in when folks are out in the yard during the growing season. Master gardeners are volunteers who are trained and certified in all things related to home horticulture. They help extension agents disseminate research-based gardening information through a variety of activities that reach young and old alike. Well, Farm Week traveled to DeSoto County to meet a veteran master gardener volunteer who is more passionate than ever about serving and educating others. When I came, uh, I, one of the, the questions that they had on the application was, uh, why do you want to be a master gardener? And I said, well, I've been digging in the dirt. I want to, I want to find out what I've been digging for. It was 15 years ago that Betty Pruitt signed up to become a master gardener volunteer in DeSoto County. Her only regret about that today is that she didn't do it sooner. Betty's mentor on this journey is Extension Service County Coordinator Joy Anderson. I would say that Betty's kind of unusual in that um, she's one of my success stories that uh, when she started the program and I told her, you know, there's the educational component, she flat out told me, I'll never speak in front of a group of people. And now you can't shut her up. Master Gardener volunteers like Betty Pruitt are the right hand of county agents when it comes to questions about home gardens. They are highly trained and help county extension offices reach a much broader audience with research proven horticulture information. Well, it allows me to do a whole lot more education in the county. Um, one person, it's really hard, we're in one of the largest counties population wide in the state. Um, I think the last figure the was 100, growing, I yeah, 167,000 people and I'm one horticulture agent. And so in order for me to, to really make an impact, you have to have that volunteer base that's helping you get out in the community and, and doing horticulture programs so that people know how to take care of their home garden. And that frees me up to be able to do other things, like working with the commercial folks. We get to 
be able to see other people's gardens and and be able to interact with some other people in the community, which is great. And then when we do our library lecture series and people come, you know, you'll start off on one topic, but then the question period comes and it just goes off on all the different things. So sometimes a 20 minute talk may end up an hour and the people are still asking questions. That makes you feel so good when you do that. It's really great. Across the parking lot from the DeSoto County Extension Office is a garden where Betty Pruitt and other Master Gardener volunteers in the county receive their first hands-on training in horticulture. It's known here as the Learning Garden. Not every county is able to have a teaching resource like this. This garden is also a certified Monarch Butterfly way station. They've uh, planted a lot of butterfly weed. That's what this flower is over there that, uh, that you saw the, uh, the caterpillar on. Uh, up in the uh, up in the butterfly garden area, up in the woods, you're go you'll see some of the little um, the, the casings that the, that the uh, butterfly is going to emerge from. I was hoping maybe today that y'all would actually see see one emerge, but they're a little sleepy or tired or whatever, so maybe not. As with 4-H, you learn by doing. It's much better when they can get out here and actually do what needs to be done and see it being done than just giving them a piece of paper and saying, you know, read this and do this. Right. So it works a whole lot better. In exchange for 40 hours of training, each Master Gardener volunteer like Betty Pruitt is certified and volunteer to return 40 hours of service to their communities within one year. I know that the first year I was scared to death. How in the world am I gonna get 40 hours in? and I got 104 in that year. So, and it sort of climbs up and down, you know, but usually somewhere around 100 hours a year. One of Betty Pruitt's first volunteer projects after being certified was being involved in a plant camp for children. She still looks forward to that event each year. We do a plant camp every year for, we keep it at 30 so that uh, we, can, we can corral them because sometimes they'll start out sort of shy on a Monday. By Wednesday, it's like herding cats. You gotta, you gotta sort of keep up with them. And that's, that's the fun time when you see those kids learning and their eyes are brightening up. This year we had uh, a little boy that got to be a beekeeper. He put his suit on and got to do with the bees and things. I mean, those, yeah, those are, price. yes. That's, that's what makes a master gardener glad she's a master gardener. The volunteers are required to receive continuing education along the way. To remain certified in the program, master gardeners attend 12 hours of training and return 20 hours of volunteer service each year following their first one. For Betty, as you heard earlier, meeting the minimum has never been a problem. The opportunities to serve are many and also varied, and she enjoys every one of them. We have a Master Gardener hotline here that we man during the springtime. We also, uh, on Saturdays, we go to Farmer's Market down there at uh, Hernando. And uh, we have, it's called Ask the Master Gardener, where we give out pamphlets, but people bring us all sorts of stuff. And sometimes, uh, Joy will say, oh, could you go out to such and such house uh, and, and check on this uh, garden problem that they've got? And so we'll go do that. And once I've got them trained, if I get a call and I think it's the right kind of call, I'll call them and say, I need you to go and see this person about their problem. And I explain to them what's going on and I make sure that they have the tools that they need to go out and do that home visit, whether it's publications or um, clippers to get samples so that we can send it off if they need to. Agents describe the Master Gardener Volunteer Program as a great way to gain horticulture expertise while meeting other avid gardeners and getting connected to the community. Volunteer Betty Pruitt doesn't see any downside, no matter your background, your age, or your education. Do you know, I don't think there's a person that wouldn't enjoy it once they got in. We've had people that were a little timid about going, coming into us saying, oh, well, I don't know anything about horticulture, so I can't do this. If you like to go out and pull weeds or look at flowers or dig in the dirt, it doesn't matter. We've got 
doctors, we've got lawyers, we've got school teachers, we've got little old people like me that's never done anything. That once you get into the Master Gardening Program, if you care about horticulture at all, or if you don't even know about horticulture, if you just care about gardening and flowers, I'd say jump in with both feet. You won't regret it. It'll, it'll be the best time of your life. From Hernando, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. And Amy, there are more than 1,000 Master Gardener volunteers in the state, like Betty Pruitt right now. They do an incredible job, as you heard, of increasing extension capacity to meet the growing public demand for horticulture information. Yes, there are 62 counties in Mississippi that have Master Gardener uh, programs. A lot of volunteer service has been provided over the past 25 years. And of course, you can contact your county extensions office if you're interested in becoming a volunteer like Betty. Well, that's going to do it for our, week, our show this week. You want to make sure to tune in next week, though. Yes, in Southern Gardening, see why combination containers are the perfect choice to stand up to the late summer heat. They can also add color and interest to any landscape. And we've got a really interesting feature story planned for you. Wild hogs are causing headaches across much of the country. To put it bluntly, they're tearing up farmland and crops. We'll examine the wild hog problem and see what you can do to regain control of your land. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Amy Myers. Remember, if you missed a story, you can find past episodes of Farm Week under the Shows tab on our website, extension.msstate.edu. And don't forget, follow us on Facebook and Twitter to join in on the conversation. We'll see you next week.